my name is Justin Lemire Elmore. I've been involved in the electric bicycle scene here in Vancouver for over 16 years now. I started as a student at UBC in 2002, 2003 with an electric bicycle club. Um, and over that year, over that time, have uh, amassed a pretty in-depth amount of experience dealing with electric bicycles and specifically the side of electric bicycles focused on converting normal bikes into electric assist. Uh, so the point of this talk today is going to be to do a fairly high level survey of what kind of options are available for electric kits today and how to choose among those options to best suit what your specific needs are. Um, so it could come up increasingly frequently now, why would you convert a bike in the first place? And if you attend any bike show like this, if you go to bike shop, there's actually quite a few ready to ride electric bikes that you can buy uh, with no need to convert in the first place. It may seem a little bit unnecessary or outdated that you would start with a regular bicycle retrofitted to have an electric bike when you could from the get-go start with a bike that rolls by itself. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons why e-bikes conversions can actually have long-term and short-term benefits and can be better suited for what you're after. Uh, so a really typical reason that someone would come for us for a conversion kit is because they already own a bicycle and there's no point getting a second bicycle into the household just to have electric. So if you have a bike that you're comfortable riding, it's a style that you like, uh, converting it allows you to maintain that bicycle and everything you love about it with the additional perk of having electric assist on it. It's also pretty common that in spite of all the e-bikes that are out there right now, you won't find exactly what you're after. So some people have really specific needs that can be stylistic needs, but also functional needs. So people riding, say, hand cycles because they can't use their legs, people who are interested in recumbent bikes. There's many fewer options for pre-made electric once you start getting in some of the niche fields for electric bikes. It also comes up in terms of pure performance. So the turnkey electric bikes that you might see in a shop are really centered around a pretty standard range of power and speed and range levels that's deemed sort of in the midpoint of the market. What would the most people want for the distance that they need to travel in a day or how much power they need? Um, if you're somebody who wants to go 120 kilometers on a touring trip, no off-the-shelf bike is going to do that kind of distance. Uh, similarly, if you're dealing with a situation where you're using your e-bike as a work vehicle and you might need to carry two, three hundred pounds of landscaping equipment in a trailer, you're not going to find an off-the-shelf bike that has those kinds of power and torque levels to do that effectively and efficiently. Um, for other people, the whole point of building an e-bike and doing a conversion is just for the fun project. And if there's ever a rewarding do-it-yourself project, it's hard to top building something that you can actually ride and have fun with. And the last two points here are things that aren't necessarily obvious for some people that initially come to us, um, but from a long-term perspective can play a really significant role in the value or merits of doing a conversion from the start as opposed to buying a ready-to-go electric bike. And one of those is the ability to swap parts in and out. So when you build a bike from a kit, you're dealing with separate components. You have a separate battery, a separate motor, a separate motor controller, and each of those pieces of electronics is one, subject to failure, and B, subject to improvement. As the technology improves, the motors year after year are getting better and better. The batteries are getting lighter, more powerful, less expensive, and electronics are things that everyone's familiar with having finite shelf lives. Um, and when you get a complete factory e-bike, they tend to integrate all those parts into a set of proprietary components. So if you look at that bottom picture there, that's what happens if you disassemble a factory bike that you were to buy on the floor. Every single gear in there is specially made just for that one bike by one company. All those electronics are not portable. You can't run that motor or that system with a third-party motor controller very easily. So if you're thinking long, long term, when you actually invest in a conversion kit, you're getting parts that can last the lifespan of your bicycle, which from our experience is 10 years, 20 years, even 30 or 40 years. And uh, we see no reason that electric bikes shouldn't have that same longevity that we're used to seeing with bicycles. And bicycles can do that because they've adopted a few common standards for components and, and component interchangeability. And at this point in the electric bike space, that's not what's happened. Every e-bike tends to go its own proprietary route. So then comes the question of, well, do I have the skills to convert a bike? And some people look at a bike and say, no problem, I can do that. Some people think, that's crazy. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't know how to solder. I don't know how to deal with connectors. You don't need an electrical engineering degree to convert a bike. In fact, you don't need to know really anything about electronics at all. In any conversion kit that you get, the plugs are just going to mate unambiguously. Um, you also don't need to be a really skilled bike mechanic. And so a lot of people, they come to us, they want a conversion kit, but they don't want to install it. They want to take it to a bicycle store for the installation. 
and they don't realize that the process of installing a bike is really very little different than simply fixing a flat tire, adjusting your gears, or doing any of the normal routine bike maintenance. So if you're mechanically inclined enough that you work on and service your bike, if you tweak your derailleur, you have the right level of skills and mechanical inclinations required to install the kit. On the electrical front, one thing that we've found really wonderful about e-bike conversions and people taking them on as projects is that they end up learning a lot about electronics from riding a bike that's electrically powered. Um, so even if you don't start off knowing the difference between a volt and an amp or an amp hour or a watt hour, within a month or two of riding an e-bike, those become part of your vocabulary and you end up actually building familiarity with electricity that you maybe never picked up in all your years of high school and college. Um, but we do emphasize that when you do a, a retrofit or a conversion, having a sort of can-do problem-solving attitude is really important. Um, so oftentimes the kit will install seamlessly on the bike. There's no fitment issues or no compatibility problems. More often than not, you're going to run into some little hiccups that can always be solved with a little bit of clever or lateral outside-the-box thinking. Um, that you know, affects you know, a lot, you know, how to get the throttle on the handlebar if your hand grip's not coming off easily or if your bike frame is all curvy and your battery's meant to go on a square tube, there's always solutions to that, but it requires uh, an attitude that you want to solve it. And as far as the time it takes to convert a bike, uh, tomorrow we're going to be on this very center stage here doing a live conversion of a bicycle into electric assist, and we have a 30-minute time window. So we're starting with the bare bike. We're going to wind up 30 minutes later with it electrified. The typical person doing this as a first go, I would usually tell them to budget an afternoon. So anywhere from three to four hours just to deal with any contingencies that come up and to give you time to rethink how you run the wires and the cables and try to make it look really nice. Uh, so at this point, if, if you go to our website or come to a shop, what you see is a myriad of motors. We have over 50 different motor styles. Uh, motor SKUs in inventory. If you go online, you'll be bombarded with all kinds of options. And we really like to break that down into four key categories of conversion kit that address four kind of different needs or end user applications. Um, so the first one that I have showing here is just a small geared hub motor. So hub motors are, are hubs that replace the bicycle hub in the wheel that have the motor built in. And when we say small, we're talking about motors that are, are normally rated for 250 to 500 watts, and they weigh about two kilos. So that's four to five pounds of weight. It's not much to add to the weight of a normal bicycle. Um, going slightly larger than that, we have geared hub motors that are in the four kilogram territory. And these are motors that can produce really high torque. So if you're doing applications where you need to pull heavy loads or go up steep hills, a larger size motor that's geared gives a lot of merits to that. Going even bigger still, the third option there is what we call a direct drive hub motor. And these are motors that have no internal gears. So the entire motor is the hub. And because there's no gears to amplify the torque, the motor itself needs to be larger in order to have sufficient torque to power the bike. And then the last option here is the mid-drive motor. Um, and mid-drive motors have become increasingly common in recent years. And they, rather than driving the wheel directly, they put the motor to drive your cranks. And so the motor power is now going through the cranks, which allows it to couple into your shifting and have all of your gear range advantages. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these four options and where they, they apply for people. The small geared motors in the 250 to 500 watt power range, those ones are super popular for people who are already cyclists and they need a little bit of an extra boost. So that's commuters who now, their job's moved or they've moved and they have to go instead of a five kilometer bike to work, it's now 20 kilometers. And they wouldn't do that every day just under leg power. The benefit of these small motors is that they're not adding much weight to the bike, so when you're riding it without the battery or without electric, it still feels and handles like your original bicycle did. And uh, they're, they're, they kind of have the least effect, as I was saying, on, on how the bike feels as a bike. But if you're dealing in situations where you need to climb, say, the hills in North Vancouver going up to Cyprus, a little motor like this is certain to overheat if you were to go full tilt all the way, or it would just be underwhelming. You'd be doing most of the work with your legs. So they have their application, and the, the amount of power to put that in context, so 250 to 500 watts, that is Lance Armstrong's full output over the course of one of his tour legs. So it's not insignificant, but when you're going up a steep hill, you actually need a significant amount of power in order to sustain a decent speed. When we talk about the larger geared hub motors, these ones are uh, uh, 
heavier, obviously, because they're bigger. There's not nearly as many on the market because it's not as common of a usage category. But they're really ideal for applications where you need lots of torque on the wheel, but you don't necessarily need a high speed. So that comes up all the time for cargo applications. So people who are now have their two children sitting on a, the back rack of their bicycle, or people who are living in a steep territory, they're not interested in speed, but a small motor just doesn't have the power to do that level of hill climbing. So they also uh, have no drag when you're riding the bike without the motor running because they're geared motors and they have an internal freewheel. Um, but because they're running at higher power levels, you're kind of more likely to overload them if you're not careful. Um, so we've had more instances of people stripping the mechanical gears on these bigger motors because they're tempted to push them harder. Um, and now we get to direct drive motors, which are the simplest of all motors. As I mentioned, there's no internal gears, no moving parts in them. Uh, the lack of gears makes these motors completely silent. So the previous two motors that I talked about, because there's a gear set inside, you can hear a little bit of buzz coming out of the wheel. Uh, some have reduced that almost completely by using helical or spiral cut gears, but on most of them you'll be able to hear that noise if you're riding on a quiet bike path. If you're riding anywhere with traffic or where there's ambient sound, that noise is pretty much inaudible. But a direct drive motor has nothing moving in it, so it's always nice and silent. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in order to get adequate torque when you don't have gears, the motor has to be big. And when I say big, we're talking averaging five to seven kilograms. The biggest one's getting up to nine kilos. So that, by perspective, is as heavy as a lot of complete bicycles themselves. So it very much changes the dynamic of your bicycle. If you have to pick your bike up a flight of stairs or put it on the, uh, you know, the drop down of a, of a, a bike rack on the bus, um, you're you know, putting a huge amount of weight either on the front or the rear wheel where that mass is located. Um, the direct drive motor, because it's always engaged, the, the magnets are always moving past the iron. There's always a bit of drag because you're spinning the motor whenever you're pedaling the bike. And that drag is comparable pretty much to the rolling resistance of a tire. So if you were to imagine you know, riding a bike with really high pressure road slicks and then switching it over to having some sort of knobby mountain bike tires, that's comparable to the drag that the motor itself is putting on the bicycle. So if you're somebody who's expecting to use the motor almost all the time, that doesn't matter at all. And the direct drive motor, because of its elegance, uh, lack of moving parts and robustness, is a really good choice. Uh, but if you're somebody who's anticipating doing long stretches of your cycling without the assist engaged, then you might find that drag a little bit of an annoyance because you're always, your ability to pedal the bike is encumbered a bit by the presence of the motor there. Uh, but with the downside of drag comes a really strong positive, and that's regenerative braking. Uh, so motors of this style, because the motor's always engaged, can use the motor as a substitute or an alternate brake rather than using the mechanical brake pads. And that is the ability to take over 90 to 95% of the stopping energy that you would otherwise be burning through your caliper, your rubber rim brakes, or your calipers, the pads on your disc calipers. And that can almost mean zero disc maintenance. And on an e-bike, you're often going faster and carrying more weight and burning through brakes a lot quicker. So we have people before getting Regen that are telling us that they were replacing their brake pads every two months. And it was the biggest, most frequent maintenance headache. Um, and then with the advent of them switching to a system with regenerative braking, they've gone years without even tweaking or adjusting their brake position. Um, so when you're interested in a low maintenance vehicle, the Regen does a, does a huge boost at reducing one of the frequent maintenance overheads on a bike. Um, and they also, they can do steep hill climbing, but they're not as efficient as the previous, as the geared motors. Um, where they really shine is at going fast. So a motor like this gains increasingly efficiency the faster that it's running. So for people that want a high speed e-bike, a direct drive is almost, without a doubt, the best option. And then we get to the mid-drive motors. And so on a mid-drive motor, Typically, the conversion kits in the past, if you look at the bottom, they're often quite elaborate, complex mechanical machines with lots of exposed gears. Uh, about four or five years ago, some companies started making really easy to install mid drives that uh, drop into the bottom bracket of the bike and replace your right chain ring with the chain ring that's motorized. And so by allowing the, chair, the drive to go through the bicycle gears, you can then downshift and upshift in order to change the torque that you have at the wheel. So you can climb up the steepest hill in an easy gear, the motor will purr along at a half the RPM, um, and you don't have the risk of overheating. On the other hand, you're going up the hill slowly. So if you wanted to compare 
going up a hill fast, a mid-drive motor has no advantage over one of the geared hub motors. It only has that advantage if you use the gears in downshift. The downside of doing that is that now all of the power of the motor that's propelling the bike is going through the bicycle chain. And bike chains were engineered and optimized for human power levels. And a human power level, on average, is about 120 watts. And you can stand on the cranks and really refit and have torque levels comparable to a motor. But when you combine a human power and the motor power all into the same chain, you're greatly accelerating the rate at which the chain stretches, the rate to which the cogs wear down. And those things mean a higher and higher uh, maintenance overhead involved with owning the e-bike. So the advantages are definite and pronounced, but that uh, comes with the downside of additional maintenance. A hub motor reduces the draw, the, the, the stress that you put on the mechanical side of the bike, because instead of you standing and pedaling hard up a hill, a lot of that power is now happening just at the hub. The bicycle chain is only exposed to normal pedaling efforts, and a mid-drive kind of does the opposite, it amplifies it. Um, another downside of the mid-drive is that because it's putting that force through the, the drive chain, it would, if you're using an internal gear hub on the back, also put all that extra power through an internal hub that was never engineered for that. It was engineered for human power levels. And when people install these kits with a bike with an internal gear hub, if you run it more than human power levels, sort of the 200, 250 watt point, you want a really high risk of just blowing up the gears in your internal hub. Uh, the few exceptions would be a roll-off, which can handle phenomenal torque levels, and some of the early Nubinchi motors. Uh, but by and large, most of the, you know, the Alphine, the 7-speed, 8-speed, 11-speed internal hubs are not compatible with a mid-motor like this. Um, but the application, because the weight's not in the wheel, it has kind of the least effect on handling a bike, especially if you're doing off-road kind of riding. So if you're riding and doing mountain biking, this can let you go up the hills efficiently at a low speed in an easy gear and allow the handling of the bike to be least affected when you're going downhill and on trails. So that's a summary of the four major groups of hub motors and every system that we fall clearly falls into one of those four categories. Um, when you're talking about a hub motor, there also comes up a choice of installing it on the front or the rear of the bicycle. And a lot of people come to us with an expectation or anticipation that the motor has to be on the bike. They think something's just wrong about a motor on the front. That would be so weird pulling the bicycle rather than pushing it. Um, that's all kind of in your head. There's really very little physical reason why a front wheel would behave, handle, or feel any differently than a rear wheel. Um, the cases where that breaks down is if you're doing things where you're lifting the wheel off the ground, so mountain biking where you have to hop over logs, or if you're putting so much torque in the motor that it risks spinning out. And with motor powers up to 500 or even 1,000 watts, a front motor has more than enough traction that you can go full tilt on the throttle and not risk the wheel skidding. But if you're running 1,500 watts or if you're riding in a place with loose gravel roads, say you live on, uh, you know, you're out in the countryside going up a driveway, a front motor really will skid out quite easily if it only has the traction of loose gravel. So then you have to shift and put some weight over the wheel to not skid. So um, on the benefit side of the front motors, though, you're not tying into the drivetrain. So you don't care about matching the you know, an 11 speed shifter system and getting a hub motor that can fit an 11 speed cassette. You can use belt drives, you can have internal gear hubs. It's, the motor becomes 100% independent from the mechanical drive and that allows it to be the most universal and it also simplifies the installation because you're simply swapping a front wheel and you're not dealing with realigning derailers and gears and all that stuff. Um, another little benefit, I mentioned traction uh, when you're using a front motor going up hills or on loose gravel, it actually turns out that in a different situation, which is snowy road conditions, a front motor is actually quite nicer. Um, and it has the ability to help keep the front of your bicycle underneath you as the wheel would otherwise tend to slide out. So we've, to our surprise, found people actually coming after us for front motors who ride in, in snowy parts of the country because the dual wheel drive, front and rear from the human power, front from the motor, gives them better traction and control on the snow. Um, it's a bit of a different situation than with, with loose dirt. Um, uh, to the rear hub motor's credit is that it looks a lot more discreet, so you can see the motor on the front of a bicycle more clearly. When the motor's in the rear, it's kind of tucked between the disc on one side, the cassette system on the other side. You might have pannier bags, and if you're interested in keeping the look of your bike as non-electric looking as possible, a rear motor would be a preferable option for most people that way. 
Um, one of the things I've, I've mentioned a few times loosely here, watts and you know, power, and power is a, a critical parameter for the performance of any vehicle. Uh, that is literally how much power is going on the bike, which is exactly going to control the acceleration, what kind of hill it's going to climb, how fast it will go. But the powers that get thrown around when you go shopping for conversion kits are all over the map. There's no real consistent way that uh, kit companies or companies selling complete bikes actually rate power or define the power. So if you look at the two images on the bottom here, on the left is a conversion kit, it's a direct drive hub motor, and they're calling it a 5,000 watt motor wheel kit. And on the right, you see another direct drive hub motor, probably a little bit less powerful than the one on the left. I think it's that the one on the right is probably about a, a six kilo motor. The one on the left, I know it's a wider one, it's more like eight kilograms. Um, so I'd expect the one on the left to be about 25 to 30 percent more powerful just based on the weight of the motor, but this one's being sold as a 250 watt conversion kit. So there you see over an order of magnitude difference just from marketing tactics on how you decide to define the wattage. When you see stuff rated at 250 watts, it's quite often because the manufacturer wants to sell it to the European market and EU e-bike regulations stipulate a 250 watt rating but they don't really clarify what does it mean to rate it at 250 watts. And so if you were to take you know, a Bosch e-bike or one of the specialized e-bikes, these you know, common turnkey factory bikes that all say 250 watts and measure the power going into the motor, you'll actually see about 800 watts when you're going up a steep hill or using it at full power. And if you measure the power coming out of it, it tends to be around 600 to 650 watts. People selling bikes interested in the European market will generally underspec the watt number that you see Whereas people selling online to an American market that are all about power, power, power will now grossly overstate it. And so in this case, the 5,000 watt rating comes because uh, I think this is sold with a 60 amp motor controller and they say you can use it up to a 90 volt battery pack. So if you take 90 volts times 60 amps, you get around 5,000 watts. Um, that is a power level that this motor could not sustain for more than a few minutes before completely overheating. Um, but that doesn't stop them from using that as the thing. So, yeah, there's lots, it's, I, I could go on a, a very lengthy explanation on how to actually understand the performance difference of motors. I just want to say right now, if you're doing sh comparison shopping and one bike says 250 watts and another says 350 watts, don't take that to mean anything. If you want to know how it actually feels, hop on the bike and ride it, because there's a huge gradient in how people choose the number that they associate. So now I'm just going to go over a few examples of bicycles that people might approach us with at our at our shop and ask us for conversion advice and uh, and hopefully from all the introduction that I've just gained you'll be able to look at this bike and say ah I know what's the right kind of motor for that. So here we have just a sort of a Dutch city commuter bike um, and in these style of bicycles they like to have an internal gear hub on the back, the chain fully enclosed, often there would be a belt drive and the idea is a zero low maintenance bicycle that doesn't have all the mechanical headaches of our, our modern chain derailleur systems. Uh, so that eliminates the option of doing a rear motor, it eliminates the option of a mid-drive motor, but the front is wide open and available for conversion. And in this case, in the application is for riding around the city, they're not needing high power, steep hills are carrying, they don't see any ability to carry cargo on that bicycle. So one of the low power geared hub motors would be a perfect option for retrofitting a bike like this. Um, this comes up often enough where we have a lot of customers in rural parts of the country. Um, so people living on the Gulf Islands have to deal with nightmarish up down, up down grade hills and a lot of unpaved roads. And in this case, as I was explaining in the front versus rear, when you do a powerful motor on the front, you tend to risk it skidding out when you're on loose gravel. So for an application like that, you would want either a rear hub motor, which will work really well if you like the simplicity of a hub motor, or you could do a mid-drive motor if you prefer to have the motor going through the gearing and being able to vary it that way, uh, which would potentially be more interesting if you were also doing off-road trail riding. Whereas if you're using it mostly to commute around, we would generally say a hub motor is better for commuting applications because it tends to be simpler and puts less stress on the overall bike, reducing the amount of regular maintenance overhead. Uh, here's another one that we deal with all the time, which I love, and that is the use of family bicycles. So with the advent of electric bicycles, we've seen the scope of what bicycles get used for expanding enormously. Um, and that now includes people regularly ferrying two children, sometimes three children with them on their bike. And in those cases, you're now doubling the amount of mass, roughly, that the motor has to deal with. And that means you kind of need twice the power motor in order to achieve the same results. 
but when you're riding a cargo bike like this, you're not interested in speed. You don't want to be zipping with your kids at 40 kilometers an hour. So a motor that has good torque at low speeds is an ideal solution. And for this, we would suggest either a front or a rear hub motor would be great. And here, because it's a stretch frame cargo bike, the mass of the rider is pretty much centered between the front and the rear wheels. So you'd actually get exactly the same traction on a front or a rear. There's other bicycles where if you're seated right over the back and there's no weight on the front, that would really incentivize using a rear hub motor for the traction regions, but cargo bikes actually shift the weight more to the front. Um, so either choice would work just fine. If you really have a lot of cargo, you can run dual motors. And so we've had installations like this where we put a motor on both, and then you could go up to the top of Cypress Mountain towing a trailer full of you know, snowmaking equipment and not have the motors overheat. Um, here's another one that we like to deal with that's a bit fun, and that's tadpole tricycles. So there's a, a strong contingent of people that are into trikes for stability reasons, for speed reasons, uh, for comfort reasons. And in a tricycle, your two front motors are supported by a single side only. So the hub motors are meant to go on a fork where you support it from both sides. So that really just leaves the rear as your only viable option for doing a hub motor. And, and this is an application where somebody has, say they're going on a touring trip or they, they want to go from you know, Vancouver to Kelowna, um, and for those kind of things, you want a pretty fast travel speed, so the direct drive motor would be the choice to make uh, for a motor that's efficient for going at high speeds. You could also use a mid-drive, or mid drive, but it's pretty tricky with the uh, unusual crank setup that you have with the crank out on a boom like that. Um, say you're doing something as wild as a unicycle conversion. So here's an application where the motor not only needs to put forwards torque, it also needs to put backwards torque all the time. In order to stay balanced on a unicycle, you're pedaling backwards as much as forwards. And the motors that can couple backwards torque are direct drive motors. If you use the geared motor on this, then the motor wouldn't be able to help you give stability for the reverse direction. So uh, this would be once, you know, some of the more unusual cases that come our way where of the four motors discussed, there's only one that's really suited for the job because of the unique requirements. So you're going even more wild and have a replica penny farthing that you want to convert. Here we have an application where the front wheel is enormous. And if you put a motor in a front wheel, the larger the diameter of the wheel, the less power the motor is able to produce because that torque is acting at a much larger distance. So the same amount of torque in a big wheel gives you much lower acceleration in hill climbing than that torque in a small wheel. So when you have a choice between a big wheel and a small wheel for doing a conversion, it's always beneficial to put the motor in the smaller wheel because you get a better power density out of the motor. You'll have more hill climbing capability and better acceleration. So here the motor was, the rear wheel on penny farthing is really tiny. Uh, in this case, it was a 14 inch one. We were able to fit 16 inches in there. And when you're dealing with that small of a diameter rim, your only option are the small geared motors because the larger motors can't actually be laced. The spokes will be too small and you'd have a very difficult time getting a spoke wrench in there. So in this kind of application, the only viable option was that small geared motor choice. So I'm gonna just quickly go over some common misconceptions that uh, people have or people may have read about related to electric bicycles. Uh, one of the most common ones, and especially given the extensive amount of marketing effort that a lot of mid-drive bike manufacturer and kit manufacturers have been promoting, is that mid-drive motors are way more efficient than hub motors because they go through the gearing. And that's not really the case at all. If you look at the average power consumption of people on mid-drive e-bikes or hub motor e-bikes, they tend to be more or less the same. A hub motor, a direct drive one, can do regenerative braking, allowing you to capture extra energy. Um, and in, if you average it out, it's true that going up a steep hill, the mid motor will have advantages, but then when you're just riding on the flats, you have additional gearing losses and mechanical drivetrain losses. We also hear it really frequently said that you should never install a motor on a suspension fork. And that's one of the reasons why people are insistent on having a rear hub motor, because they think I can install a motor on a suspension fork. That's also completely untrue. Uh, the only concerns with the suspension fork is that there's, there's a lot of torque on the motor that twists the axle, and you have something called a torque arm that needs to be installed to resist that twist. If you install a torque arm, there's no reason that you can't have a motor on a suspension fork. Um, we also hear a lot that regenerative braking isn't worth it, it's only a few percent extra range, why would you do that? And that totally misses the point. If you have a direct drive motor, regenerative braking is free energy back in the battery that you otherwise wouldn't have, and it's an, a massive extension in the lifespan of your braking system. There's no downside to regen if you have an e-bike motor. It shouldn't be a question of do I activate or not activate regen. Of course you do. It's all win. 
Um, and then I've mentioned before about this idea that front motors are somehow strange because they pull you rather than push you, and that really doesn't affect the, principle, the physical principles that propel a bicycle on the road. Um, so I'm just going to go now over the other side of the bicycle conversion kit, which is battery choices. Um, batteries have come a very long way since we first started playing around with conversion kits 15 years ago. Uh, the days of lead acid are long gone, the days of nickel cadmium are long gone, the days of nickel metal hydride are long gone. Everything now is lithium, and lithium batteries have more than doubled in their energy density and more than tripled or five times in the power density since they first came to market in e-bikes about six or seven years ago. So in general, batteries can mount either on the rear rack of the bike or somewhere in the frame. Most people prefer the battery in the frame area because it leaves the rear rack available for cargo capacity storage and it keeps the center of gravity a bit lower. But given how light lithium batteries are, it's not that much of, a, of an awkward burden to have the battery higher up on a rear rack if that's where it fits most appropriately. So one of the non-mysteries about e-bikes is how much range it will get you. I could look at any e-bike on the floor here and if you give me the specs of the battery, I could tell you like that how far it would take an average person. And that's because regardless of whether you have a hub motor or a mid-drive motor or anything else, if you're riding an e-bike at average kind of speeds and average conditions, you're going to use 10 watt hours of battery energy per kilometer traveled. Now batteries are rated in watt hours, it's the amount of energy that's in the battery pack. Um, luckily with the advent of electric cars, more and more people are familiar with watt hours and watt hours per kilometer. So a Tesla car might have 85 kilowatt hours of battery capacity, that's 8,500, 8, 85,000 watt hours. Um, a typical electric bicycle battery will be somewhere between 500 to 800 watt hours. And if you just take that watt hours and divide it by 10, that's going to be your typical range. It doesn't matter if the sticker says it'll go up to 120 kilometers. If it's a 400 watt hour battery, expect to get about 40 kilometers out of the bike. Um, and uh, to go farther, you need a larger battery. It's more expensive. There's no mystery there. Um, and you can also do a, a rough comparison of how much weight of a battery you need to go a given distance. Again, because they're all using relatively new lithium batteries, and that's about eight kilometers of distance per pound of battery weight. Um, and there's a lot of mystery and enigma surrounding batteries. A lot of people have built in these ideas, batteries having memory problems, or you should always charge the battery before you use it, or you should always discharge it fully before you charge it. None of that really applies to lithium batteries. You use the battery, it's there to serve you. You charge it when it's convenient to charge it. It's fine to drain it all the way down. It's fine more or less to charge it all the way up. Um, things people don't know about batteries and they often aren't aware of is that lithium batteries are regulated as dangerous goods. And that means that to ship a battery or to travel with a battery, you're encumbered by traveling with what's considered dangerous cargo. You can't take a battery and ship it back to the manufacturer for warranty work because you're not allowed to ship class nine dangerous goods. You can't bring a battery with you if you're traveling to Mexico and want to bring your bike and want to bring an e-bike. You can't bring the battery in the plane. You can't ship it to Mexico with a shipping courier either unless you find someone certified in the dangerous goods travel. So be aware of that if you're considering batteries for applications that you're going to be moving around the world. Either you need to buy a battery locally or there's some batteries that are exempt from this because they're much smaller in their total energy capacity. Um, and in general, the larger the battery that you get, the better the life you'll have out of it. So when we were starting in this industry, people were averaging between one to two years before a battery would be worn out. Three years was considered a good life for an early lithium battery. These days, we have so many people with batteries that they bought five, six, seven years ago that are still going fairly strong. They're not as good as they were. They might have 80 or 70% of their original range, but it's still useful as a battery pack. Um, but if you have a small battery, then you're stressing that battery a lot more than a large battery at the same power levels. And a small battery would tend to last more in the three to four year range than the five to seven year range. So paying for a big battery up front can save you in the long run for overall uh, economy of, of dollars per kilometer. And the one thing that kills batteries more than anything else is if people accidentally leave their bike on, which drains the battery all the way flat, and then store the bike over winter. So they put the bike in the garage, they bring it out the next summer. If the battery is totally flat when you store it, there's electronics in the battery that will continue to draw the battery down, and they'll drain the battery right down to the point where the lithium cells are irrecoverably damaged. Uh, so we see more batteries going to the landfill or reaching a premature end of life, not from using it, but from not using it, and not using it because they left it in a situation where it was totally flat. So if you're gonna store a lithium battery for a length of time, charge it up before you put it in storage, then there will be no issues. Uh, so that's everything. I think I've used up my allotted 30 minutes in a bit. 
Um, if you're interested for a much deeper dive, our website at ebikes.ca has lots and lots and lots of in-depth information. This was meant to be a little primer so that if you go there, you're not too scared away or frightened by the amount of, of technical and learning knowledge that's there. Um, otherwise, we have a booth at the show here where we have a lot of these motors physically on display so you can pick them up and feel them or ask us any questions directly. And uh, we're very responsive as a company to any kind of email inquiries, whether or not you're looking to buy a kit from us, just general purpose, technical knowledge or know-how, we're all about sharing all the information that we've acquired. Uh, so I thank you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the show.